one of the things that really scares the United States about China is not just what it's doing internally, not just how it's handling its business, right? Because the U.S. doesn't want to see, you know, the collective West, they don't want to see poverty alleviation and stability. All of that doesn't lend itself to getting a few people as rich as possible, as fast as possible. It doesn't lend itself to, hmm, how can we divert people's attention onto endless war? They are really concerned about as well, and probably, probably more importantly, is China's global role, China's ability to cooperate with other countries without strings attached, China's ability to lead initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative, which essentially says to the global south and the global majority, you can trade with us, we will develop your infrastructure, and we will cooperate in win-win exchanges that will make you rich, make you prosper, XYZ country, Pakistan, Venezuela, it doesn't really matter where because 140 countries are a party to the Belt and Road Initiative, but we will connect you to us and to the rest of the world. We will connect you all together so that trade connectivity is that much more efficient and effective. Because guess what? That helps me as China, that helps me as a manufacturing hub to be able to go by land and by sea to trade in this way. But also it'll help you because now your underdeveloped economies will have access to certain raw materials, commodities, et cetera, maybe even access to credit that you didn't have before. So that is what the United States is really concerned about that because with the economic influence around the world, right? China is the number one trading partner of most countries in the world, right? Whether you're talking about Australia, one of China's chief antagonists, right? So Australia is perhaps even more anti-China than the United States. Or whether you're talking about uh, uh, countries uh, like um, Ukraine, for example, you know, we're talking about countries all around the world, Russia, number one trading partner, the United States, right? Like number one trading partner is China. So with that power, with that power to be able to trade with countries and offer such lucrative and attractive arrangements, right? Attract the China will build infrastructure. They have this high technology, they have this manufacturing capacity. And if you want to invest there, it's quite cheap still, right? Despite the rising economic uh, growth that's happening in China, it's still quite cheap to invest. And there are very favorable um, arrangements you can you can make with China and with China, the Chinese government, with Chinese banks, and you can make very favorable arrangements to do business. And that's why many U.S. corporations are still there doing business. That's why many European corporations are still there doing business, but on the condition that you don't meddle in the internal affairs of China. And that's been a condition since reform and opening up. Do not meddle in our internal affairs or there will be consequences. So... China now has all of this influence and prestige around the world. It has been able to uh, expand its economic influence, but at the same time, what is often left unsaid is that its political influence, its diplomatic influence is also on the rise. And so we've seen that in the way the Ukraine conflict has played out. We've seen that in its peace uh, proposal, right? It's 12-point plan for peace in Ukraine that has garnered a lot of attention worldwide, including from Zelensky, including from Russia. You had the Xi and Putin meeting back in March of this year. You had uh, China now sending an envoy to all these countries that are party to the conflict, seeking to uh, work on peace. But also you had some incredible developments, right? In the G20, and incredible developments also happen at the ACAN conference, um, uh, the Asian conference, and also now in the Middle East, you have China brokering peace between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which has had this massive cascade effect on politics in the Middle East. You have Saudi Arabia and Iran normalizing. You have Turkey and Syria normalizing, Saudi Arabia and Syria normalizing, and now Syria is suddenly back in the Arab League. You have the Yemen war officially coming to an end, as well as the Syrian war coming to an end, because now it's back in the Arab League and Saudi Arabia and all the Arab countries 
are now engaging with Syria as the rightful, uh, the Syrian government as the rightful government of that country for the first time, really since 2011. So in a word, Chinese diplomacy, by brokering that deal in Beijing, by Iranian officials, Saudi officials sitting down and saying, we're going to, as the two of the most powerful countries, if not the most powerful countries in the Middle East, in the Arab world, in the uh, West Asian region, we are going to put aside our differences and we're going to do so with China. China did that. So China's diplomacy is a huge reason why the United States is so angry with China. And I want to play you now uh, what Scott Ritter has to say about this. He had a two-minute topic on this question of diplomacy. All right. And, and you'll hear his words. And, and take heed of his words, because in this two-minute topic, he is does not hold back on why we should be supporting China's diplomatic efforts. Here we go. Diplomacy. It's the name of a book written by Henry Kissinger, a uh, very famous uh, American diplomat, uh, statesman, somebody who was around back when the United States was the dominant force in the world, where American diplomacy actually meant something. But today, there is no more Nixon goes to China. There isn't even Trump goes to North Korea. What we have is a United States that is floundering in the world, losing its position, declining as a power. A vacuum has been created, a vacuum in a world that's torn asunder by conflict, a world that's begging for diplomacy, and yet America's not there. Who has stepped in to fill the void? China, Russia. China went into the Middle East and helped bring peace between Iran and Saudi Arabia, something that this time last year was unimaginable. And with Russia taking the lead, Saudi Arabia is now making good with Syria, again, engendering peace in the Middle East, something no American president has either been able to achieve or, frankly speaking, sought to achieve in many, many decades. And now with the Ukraine conflict, China is once again stepping in, not to, as they said, try to exploit a situation for their own national interests, but to bring about peace, to put hope on the table that there could be a life in Ukraine, in Russia, in Europe following this conflict, but this conflict has to end. This is a situation that screams for diplomacy, a situation that the United States in its past would have been able to step in and try and negotiate some sort of peaceful resolution. But the United States is not only a party to the current conflict. In Russia, but it's the leading instigator. And therefore it's up to China to fix the world's problems, to step into the void, to put diplomacy in action. Thank goodness for China. This has been my two minute topic. Remember, knowledge is power. Okay. I, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> there were some issues. I hope that you were able to hear it. Um, there was some skipping. So s people said they lost the last 10 seconds. So I can put it back up um, for the last 10 seconds just so you all get the picture. Okay. Let me do that. All right. Let me do that. So 10 seconds about here. To fix the world's problems, to step into the void, to put diplomacy in action. Thank goodness for China. This has been my two minute topic. So that's about it. I mean, but what he says is so important. Okay. What he says is so important because what he is saying is that the United States does not have any interest in diplomacy at all that it's not in a position politically to uh, achieve any kind of diplomatic resolution in all of the wars that it is starting. And yet it is China and Russia too, because I believe that the Saudi and Iran deal opened up the door for Russia to help broker what happened with Syria and Saudi Arabia. And now Turkey and, Sa and, and Syria are also getting close to normalization. We're talking about a cascade effect that has been facilitated in large part by China. And these diplomatic moves are part and parcel 
of a broader problem that the United States is seeing, which is that China is actually attractive. China has the ability to leverage its economic influence to tell other countries, do you want to prosper or do you want to circle the drain being led like a poodle by the United States? And I believe that China, both China and Russia have been having serious conversations with other countries like Saudi Arabia and have been very influential in convincing countries like Saudi Arabia to be more strategically independent. If you read Chinese media, especially the Global Times, which is a very important media outlet to read because the Global Times, as people say, it's just the tabloid of the Communist Party of China because it's uh, affiliated with the People's Daily, supposedly. But the Global Times is the most colorful, I would say, English language media outlet that China produces for audiences that, you know, English speaking audiences in the in the West and elsewhere. And the Global Times regularly talks about whenever diplomatic arenas are being entered, whether it's the Middle East or Europe or anywhere else, always talk about and this is a government line too. This is how the Chinese government thinks. They always talk about strategic autonomy, strategic independence. They're never going to argue you should stop talking to the United States. You should stop doing business with the United States. You should stop. Uh, you should. You should only work with us. But what what they will say often and always to European countries like France during Macron's visit, to the European Union overall, when the European Union starts to get a little bit. Uh, testy and rowdy and wants to kind of mix it up with China, tries to be a bully, jungle Joseph, Joseph Burrell, right? Wants to talk, you know, talk big to China. What they'll always say is, do you want to be strategically autonomous and prosper? Or do you want to circle the drain and walk like a poodle with the United States? They don't put it in those words, but that is my interpretation of what they're always saying. Do you want strategic autonomy, which is best for you? Or do you want to follow the United States, which is not good for you? And so Chinese diplomacy essentially operates as such. It operates as we can win together. We can do business together. We can economically grow together. Look at what we've done. And that's where the domestic situation is so tied to the foreign policy. It's that look at what we've done. We were once the poorest country in one of the poorest countries in the world pre-1949 and even much of 1949 to 1959, 60 plus. We're one of the poorest countries in the world all the way up until the 70s. Now we've uh, uh, lifted 850 plus million people out of extreme poverty. We've grown at 10% per year on average in some decades. And now we're still growing at somewhere between 4 to 10% every single year. Now we're leading in all these high-tech fields. We're integrating the world economy. We have these infrastructure initiatives that have the ability to integrate and raise the level of development for everyone. We can lead de-dollarization with you all, the global majority, through mechanisms like BRICS. We got it going on. And so maybe we should all talk about how to have a favorable international situation for us to do this kind of business. And I believe that's why Saudi Arabia, that's why Iran, that's why Syria, that's why Turkey, that's why Russia, that's why a lot of countries look at China and say, well, no, we can definitely make compromises if it means we can follow along a successful path like China's. It'll be different in form, but we can look at that example as something to emulate in our own context so that it's a win-win. We get to remain legitimate. Saudi Arabia's government, for example, gets to go on. It gets to be just as it was. It just doesn't have to be just some lapdog of the United States. And that's the real big issue that the United States has with China's winning diplomacy. That's what I call it. It is winning diplomacy. And the United States, it's not just the United States that has this issue. Because the U.S., right, as Scott Ritter said, they are not prepared nor willing to engage in true diplomacy around the world. They are ratcheting up conflict. You have heard probably over and over and over again from U.S. officials, from 
Anthony Blinken to Jake Sullivan, who was recently pounding his chest about China. You've heard from all of these forces about how this isn't the time for China's peace plan, right? They're all saying that it's not the time for peace, right? China may be proposing peace, but it's not John Kirby, right? White House spokesperson, defense spokesperson. It's not the time for peace. It's the time to supply Ukraine with weapons and to get ready for a counteroffensive that who knows when it will happen. Doesn't matter. We just want to sell weapons, push weapons, escalate, grind down Ukraine's military and sanction the world and just really enforce full spectrum dominance, right? Flood the war world with weapons and sanctions and watch it burn. That's what the United States is saying to the world. And China is saying the opposite. China is saying, well, we have weapons and China definitely deals weapons. It has a, it has a military industry, but it's not a top priority. It makes up like a single digit percentage amount of all weapon sales around the world. What China says is, well, okay, if you want some weapons, I guess we can supply those, but we really have the real goods. We have the technology to help you rapidly build major infrastructure pro development projects, which will jumpstart your industries, i.e. building most of Africa's electric grid, building internet systems, 5G, 4G technology in Bolivia and Saudi Arabia too, right? These are the goods, the real goods, right? the roads, the bridges, the high, the high tech cooperation, that is the real goods. Iraq, right? They have a deal with Iraq to build a thousand schools in Iraq, many of which were burned to the ground because of US, the US's bombing campaign during the 2003 to 11 formal invasion. And of course, the bombing continued after that. So China's got the goods. And China thus has the ability to say, let's trade. Let's also wage peace. Let's be at peace with each other. Let's not move toward war. But I want to show you the contrast here. So while China is engaging in this winning diplomacy, I want to show you what Europe is doing. Because <laughs> Europe is right now engaged in a dangerous game. Not only is Europe destroying itself through its participation in the Ukraine conflict, cutting itself off from Russia and essentially putting its um, economies, putting the EU's economies in free fall, Europe right now is actually engaging in what is another form of suicide, and that is, quote unquote, they first called it decoupling. Now they don't want to talk about decoupling because Europe is very scared about China, the consequences China will enact if they truly talk about decoupling. So then you had Annalena Baerbach say, de-risking, right? And she said that um, right after uh, 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 all of these conversations were going on about investment curbs and all of that in, in the lead up to the G7 after the foreign minister's uh, uh, gathering of the G7. So Annalena Baerbach, the German foreign minister, said, yeah, maybe we should de-risk in, in Qingong. They were meeting, actually. Chin Gong said right to Baerbach's face, that's a provocation. You might want to rethink that because it's not going to go well for you. And certainly we're going to have to take measures to protect ourselves from it. And now the EU is coming together again to deliberate about China. To they're, they're having, you know, EU countries are, are meeting. Their ministers, their defense ministers are meeting. Their top diplomats are meeting about tweaking their China policy. And they keep using the word recalibrating. So they don't want to say decoupling because that means China might think, ooh, you don't want to economically trade anymore. Well, we're going to have to prepare for that. We're not going to let you do that without consequences. So they don't want China to think that. They don't want China to think that there, there's decoupling. But now they're saying recalibrate because of the risks involved with Chinese trade. And again, it's a big insult to China. China does not like this kind of talk. So the European Union, this is Reuters, European Union's diplomatic service has set out plans to recalibrate the bloc's China policy, aiming to reduce the risks of economic dependency on Beijing while continuing to cooperate on global issue. Essentially what this means is that the European Union is going to commit more suicide against itself 
in the name of so-called diplomacy. This is the opposite of diplomacy. It is simply economic suicide. The European External Action Service presented the proposal in a seven-page document sent to EU governments ahead of a meeting of their foreign ministers in Stockholm on Friday. The document is the EU's latest attempt to strike a balance between the views of its 27 member countries and a desire to keep a distinctive EU approach to Beijing while also preserving a close partnership with the U.S., i.e. the U.S. is telling us, Big Daddy is telling us, our owner is telling us, we have to be good poodles and we have to be harsher on China. In a letter accompanying the proposal, EU foreign policy chief Jungle Joseph Burrell said there were at least three years for three reasons for recalibrating with China, quote unquote. He said these were the quote unquote degree to which China is changing with nationalism and ideology on the rise, the hardening of U.S. China competition uh, affecting all policy areas and the fact that China is a key player in regional and global issues. So there you have it. The U.S. is right here. U.S. China competition. Why would the EU need to be concerned about that? Oh, well, because the United States is in the EU's ear saying, do what we say, or do you want another Nord Stream? That's the EU is literally hostage to the United States. That's not diplomacy. None of this is diplomacy. This is all warmongering, and that's all they know how to do. The proposal seen by Reuters says that cooperation, competition, and rivalry will continue to be at the center of EU's China policy, even if weighing between these different elements may vary according to China's behavior. It's obvious, it adds, that in recent years, the rivalry respect has become more important. However, we must continue to engage with China, first, because of its influence in the world, second, because China is here to stay. Oh, well, so not only are you defeatist, not only do you bow to the United States, but you're also saying that you have no chance to do anything to China. So this is how unhinged these people are. So it says that the EU should not subscribe to a zero-sum game whereby they, there can only be one winner in a binary contest between the U.S. and China. But in terms of how they can de-risk when it comes to economic dependency, the paper suggests screening investments more closely and more robust export controls. What that means is put your economies in danger because the more you screen investments, the less investments are going to happen. You know what less investment happens to in economies? What happens to an economy when there's less investment? There's more trouble. So this is how this is just how subservient they are to the United States. And they say they should diversify sources of supply in key sectors, in particular those crucial to our green and digital transition, such as semiconductors, 5G and telecom batteries, raw materials, and critical minerals. Well, poor EU is going to find that actually China is the dominant player in all of those industries. So it's going to be pretty hard to de-risk or lessen your dependency unless you're going to build it yourself. Do you see that happening in economies like Europe and the United States, which are fostering massive, inf uh, not just inflation, but automation and privatization and austerity? No. What's happening in the EU and in the, uh, in the United States is the opposite of that. It is to undo, to destroy, to sell off, right? That is what the U.S. is good at. That's what the EU is good at now. That's why you have horrible, horrible economic problems in, both, in, in each of these respective areas, in these regions, in the collective West orbit. But I want to talk, I want to show you again what Scott Ritter was saying about diplomacy. Europe and the United States just not doing it. They don't do it. They don't know how to do it. They never really did do it. But certainly in this moment, there is no Kissinger moment. There is no normalization moment with China. Uh, there is no opportunity for that. There isn't even a Donald Trump. You heard what Scott Ritter said. There isn't even a Donald Trump to the DPRK North Korea moment. And that's just how much the neocons now control the U.S. government, how they control government policy foreign policy in particular. So EU-China relations are to worsen unless China uses influence with Russia to end the Ukraine war, said Jungle Joseph Borrell. So this is, so in my opinion, Joseph Borrell calls himself a socialist. But in my opinion, all Joseph Borrell is, is a mouthpiece for the military industrial complex and of Washington. And he is, this is what he had to say to China. This is the opposite of diplomacy. He considers himself the top diplomat of all of the European Union. And this is what he had to say to China. It is absolutely insulting. It sh it's condemnable. It is disgusting. But here's what he had to say. 
With the U.S. already tightening its noose around China over its potential help to Russia in the Ukraine war, e the EU is cautioning Beijing that it must use its influence with Moscow to end the conflict or else the already strained relations with the EU bloc will further deteriorate. Here's what Joseph Burrell had to say, Jungle Joseph. He said in a press conference in Sweden, life is complicated. If I don't like your behavior, you cannot expect to be good friends. It's as simple as that. So he's referring to China and Russia's relationship. So this comes as China's special representative on Eurasian affairs, Li Hui, is set to travel to Ukraine, Russia, and other European capitals next week to serve as an intermediary and try to resolve the conflict that has marred the Eastern European region for over a year now. So essentially, he is trying to undermine China's efforts here. That's what he's doing. And so he said, it's important that China understands that what is happening in Ukraine is an existential threat for us. So they're admitting that this conflict for the collective West is existential, that we must destroy Russia, essentially. And we expect that China will use its role and its responsibilities. If that is not the case, our relationship will not be so good. These are really strong words from Jungle Joseph here, right? Oh, man, we won't be have a good relationship because you're not doing exactly what we say. Borrell told further told the media that we had been asking China to get involved with Ukraine, and this phone call with Xi Jinping was the first small step. And this special envoy is another step towards China using its influence to stop the war. But he continues saying, we know China is really practicing pro-Russia neutrality. So this peace initiative is important for us because we're not going to have a good, we cannot have a good relationship with China if China is clearly supporting Russia. So that is what Joseph Burrell had to say to China. He is basically saying, do what we say. Not as we do. <laughs> do what we say. This has been the case since the beginning, right? This absolute nonsense that China is helping Russia in the Ukraine proxy war. When the reality is, is that the EU and the United States came together to hurt, uh, to precipitate and spark the Ukraine proxy war. And that essentially led Russia to intervene. It was the U.S.'s coup. It was its militarization of Ukraine. It was crossing all the red lines. And of course, the utter and total destructive assault of the Donbass and Russian-speaking areas of Ukraine, which was the red line for Russia. And uh, China has been accused all along for about potentially sending weapons and using possible technology to help Russia. And all of this is just uh, it, it is just the foil for what the U.S. and the EU really want from China, which is to decouple from Russia. It doesn't want China and Russia to be so close, so it wants to isolate both of them. And this is just a failed strategy to try and achieve that objective. But that is not diplomacy, and that is not going to work. China is not going to allow itself to be bullied, just like Russia does not allow itself to be bullied. China is not going to allow it. So all of this is just hot air. It's hot air from Jungle Joseph, but it shows that this um, um, gardener, the European gardener, Joseph Burrell, that what he is really preaching is a vile, crass, uh, uh, European racist exceptionalism that says the EU can tell you what to do, China, despite the fact that we are the ones collapsing. We are the ones crumbling. Our economies are sinking because we are just following the U.S. like good, well-trained poodles into our own abyss. We are sinking like Nord Stream sunk because we collaborated to destroy ourselves. But we're going to tell you, a stable, growing, increasingly influential country, what to do. We're going to tell you, a country that hasn't been at war in more than 40 years, while we have participated in all kinds of war, dozens of wars over that period, we're going to tell you what it means to wage peace. That's not diplomacy. So again, Scott Ritter is 100% right. That the, the United States is not in a position, nor is the EU. But not only this, it's also that China's diplomatic influence, its influence around the world, is a huge reason as to why the United States wants to sink China, wants to do what it's doing here, using the EU to try to isolate China, <laughs> sinking the EU further into its own abyss in order to get to China. And this is going to be increasingly a theme. We have the G7 summit coming up. 
Uh, I think it's in late May, May 19th, I believe it begins. And so that's just another opportunity for the United States to propose what it wants to propose, which is all countries that are party to the G7. And then, of course, it's going to propose it to the rest of the world. All countries need to reconsider their economic ties with China. And now it's a fa- it's a it's a fool's game. It's a failure. It's not going to work. That you're not going to get countries around the world, especially the global majority residing in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean, to reconsider their economic ties with China for what? For Nord Stream, the Nord Stream pipeline terrorist attack, for sanctions. You already have staunch economic partners of the United States and and, and and overall strategic partners of the U.S. like Saudi Arabia saying, no, 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 wagging the finger like the Kembe Matumbo saying, no, 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 you're not going to gain so much leverage that your economic sanctions on Russia are going to be implemented on us. We're going to protect ourselves. And look, look at this great friend to the east, geographically strategic, economically prosperous. Why wouldn't we do business with China? And oh, look, China is not saying that they our government needs to change, that our policies need to change, that our leaders need to change. Everyone was listening when Joe Biden screamed, right? He screamed at the beginning of the Ukraine conflict. What did he say? He said that Putin cannot remain in power. The whole world was watching when beginning right after February 20. Uh, 4th, 2022, when the U.S. and the EU began sanction after sanction to the thousands on Russia, which essentially led to an even more intense inflation crisis and an economic crisis for many countries worldwide, especially in Europe. And everyone was watching, not just with the sanctions, but everyone was watching as the United States uh, poured weapons, poured, uh, it continues to pour aid into Ukraine to not stop this disastrous conflict in Ukraine, but to escalate it further. Everyone's watching. And then the United States has the gall to lecture everyone else on this issue. So that's not diplomacy. And countries around the world don't want to hear it anymore because they don't have anything to offer anyway. The EU and the US don't have anything to offer. So whether it's not being able to or interested in diplomacy or the fact that they have nothing to offer, the United States and the EU are saying one thing and one thing only. Do what we say or else. They're trying to say that to China right now. And China, I mean, will continue to do what it's doing. <laughs> it's not going to balk. It's not going to be intimidated by the United States. The same goes for Russia. Russia's not going to be intimidated. But now more and more countries are seeing that around the world in saying, well, we don't have to be intimidated either. And even though you've had valiant struggles, valiant resistance uh, to this unipolar order from smaller countries, Venezuela being one, uh, 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 Iran, not really a small country, but relatively small compared to China, even though you've had valiant resistance, Syria, et cetera, from these small countries, they've been more vulnerable to sanctions, right? They've been more vulnerable to, let's say, your assets being completely entirely stolen. That's what also the world was watching when the U.S. stole hundreds of billions of Russian assets. But, the you know, the, these smaller countries are more vulnerable. Then they see a rising Russia and China and they say, well, we should possibly be not just friends, but really good friends with these two countries because that will help us survive the same onslaught that they're experiencing. And that is the basis of multipolarity. And it's the basis for why the United States continues in the EU as its poodle, as its lapdog, continues to spiral into this de-risking, decoupling, recalibrating with China. And it's because they're worried about Chinese diplomacy. And you know what? They really should be. Because it spells the end of their reign of dominance. It really does. It's the end of their reign of dominance. And for that, we should all applaud and be very happy. But we should also know that a dying empire, just like a rabid animal, an animal dying of rabies, 
just like a rabid animal, a dying empire is one that will not go into the night quietly.